haven't been run over while my, during my two months here. And I think we could have the same weight and measure system. Because, for example, if in France you buy an American car, you can't find the pieces to repair it. For example, every screw has not the same diameter than American ones. So I think it would be a very, very good thing, in spite of all the difficulties it may well, give, yeah. to have the same weight and measure system all over the world. And drive on one side of the road only throughout Europe. Right? Yes. Right. Good. I must say, speaking... And, and giving our own view. Well, my task is a different one. I want to say a special word to those of you who've come from the British Commonwealth overseas. I was lucky enough to visit some of you earlier this year. You made me very welcome. Your friendliness and your kindness warm my heart. I hope that in this old country, which many of you still call home, you will have as much happiness as I have had with you. I can wish you nothing but. Now, before I talk about overseas, I spent some part of my life in international affairs. Like our friends here, I visited many lands, privately and officially. I believe that among our American friends, there are men whom they call hobos. They are restless individuals who spend every night in a different place. I think I should qualify for a pretty high place in any list for hobos. But still, my experience has taught me this. There are times, for instance, in a gathering like this, when we think it ought to be quite easy for nations to understand each other. This is not altogether true. There are other times when we feel that understanding between the countries will never be reached. And that isn't altogether true either. The reality lies somewhere between the two extremes. Therefore, I say to you, and especially to our friends who have spoken this afternoon, as you go about and try to explain and create international understanding, do not exult and do not despair. Just keep pegging away. And that brings... Well, now, just before we begin the second half of the forum, I want to apologize to various briefly who they are and something of their background. On my immediate right, at the far end rather, is Patricia Tarbett from Canada. She is 18. She comes from the Northern Vocational School in Toronto. She is the daughter of an Irish mother from Australia. Keith Rayner is the son of an Australian mother and a Lancashire father. Nineteen years, a lot more about him, and we had coming last to our European representative on this board. All right, having introduced the team, let's get to the first question, which is the views of the representatives about the contribution Europe can make to the world we want. Brian Woods, let's hear from New Zealand. Well, frankly, I thought that this talk about the unity of Western Europe was a mockery in that it may help to widen the gap between the Eastern and Western blocs. The question arises as to whether we are actually becoming united or whether we are simplifying and thus making much stronger our disunity. I think as I believe Italy and Norway thought that we must keep very clearly in our mind the goal of world unity. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Marilyn Sire from the States. I'd like to say that I entirely disagree with Brian. First of all, the Marshall Plan is one way of uniting these peoples. To make it work, they must unite economically, politically, and socially. And furthermore, the Atlantic Charter, the Atlantic Pact, does not mean to say that Europe and the United States are combining against a third power. 
I think it just means they're starting the combination. This combination must be furthered, first of all, by us starting it, and then by letting Russia and the other satellite nations join us. We do not mean to, as uh, some people seem to think, to keep Russia out of it. The whole idea is to bring her and the rest of the world together. Thank you, Marilyn. Keith. Well, I think that the, uh, the ideal of European unity is an excellent thing, and we must all strive towards it. And as someone from the Dominions, I agree entirely with what Mr. Eden said, that the Dominions have set a, a wonderful example. The Dominions, in their relation with the mother country, they have set a wonderful example to Europe. And I feel it's of extreme importance that we should do everything we possibly can to strengthen our already fairly friendly relations with the new dominions of India and Pakistan and Ceylon. It's quite easy for people in Britain to feel very friendly towards people in Australia because, as Mr. Eden said, we are very much the same. But if we can show, too, that we have a commonwealth in which we are very friendly and, and have a very real spirit of fellowship for completely different people as those in India, then we're setting a wonderful example to Europe. And not only an example, but I feel a basis for a wider commonwealth, not just a British commonwealth in the future. Thank you, Australia. What is statements <coughs> and suggestions? Keith mentioned the excellent unity between the different dominions and the commonwealth. But hasn't the link between the dominions become a bit weaker now? We can take air as an example. And India and in South Africa, there are some parties who are strongly against the idea of the empire and commonwealth. I would like the dominions to answer to that. Well, let's choose from South Africa, Gerald Gordon Davis. Well, in my view, I think Australia has very well stressed the importance of the Commonwealth to the rest of the world. And I disagree with the European representative who speaks about the breakup of this happy family. Because the countries I represent, the West Indies, have known foot a plan to federate the British West Indies. And then when that has been done, dominion status would then, I presume, follow. And the strategic importance of the West Indies in a time of war, which we cannot afford to uh, omit in our considerations, would be of incalculable value. Also, it would introduce a new economic force for the empire leaders, or rather I should say, commonwealth leaders to consider. Are you satisfied? Have you anything else to say about these different countries and the way they live and the way they think and the ideas they've suggested? Well, I'll say farewell to food now. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'll go on to the people who produce food. That's to say, the farmers. It is quite well known, and Keith has already mentioned it, that the population in Australia is not very dense. There are vast areas which are deserts, but they could be made fertile if they had a people for it. So in India now at the moment, there is extreme poverty because India is simply crowded. People live well at a distance from nose to nose almost. So why don't the Indians go to Australia I do not mean that millions and millions of India should go immediately to Australia, because then Australia would be in the position that India is in now, because Australia cannot support a vast amount of people coming at once. But couldn't it be possible that, well, let's say, a thousand Indians would go and make some land fertile and then again a thousand would go and so on and on until the whole of Australia was uh, ready for agriculture. Uh -oh.